is really appreciated. But it also reminds me of something a, a mentor of mine in that very first job said to me, and uh, it's, it's remained true forever, and he said, Tillerson, just remember this. A pat on the back's only 18 inches from a kick in the behind. <laughs> he was a little more colorful. <laughs> of course, that was a long time ago, and I am grateful for the opportunities that have been presented to me over the years, and I appreciate the people that have helped me along the way, and there's been a lot of them, and a lot of them are still out there working in our corporation. And any time I receive an award, it, I always reflect on that and realize this is really something that I'm receiving on their behalf. And as CEO, you get a lot of recognition, and I also really accept this on behalf of the almost 80,000 men and women in the ExxonMobil Corporation who are working on every continent around the world with the exception of the Antarctic, and they're working under some pretty tough conditions, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, to deliver the energy that most all of us take for granted. It's just there when we need it, and we don't think too much about it. You know, the illustrious J. Willard Marriott, your school's benefactor and namesake, once said, Great companies are built by people who never stop thinking about ways to improve the business. And I believe the same can be said for universities. In just the past few decades, as I did a little reading on the Marriott School, it has developed into a well, it has developed a well-deserved reputation for excellence and has achieved a number of top rankings in both undergraduate and, and graduate business education. And I can tell you those achievements have not gone unnoticed in the business world, there's an increasing awareness that the Marriott School produces quality graduates with strong values and high ethical standards. You know, the development of personal character is so important to BYU's mission that it is seen today by leading companies to be as important a predictor of employee success as the skills you master while you're here, whether it be in accounting, marketing, management, communication, whatever your field of study. I know your faculty, along with the members of the National Advisory Council and the advisory boards, are extremely proud of all that you have achieved and will achieve once you leave this place. Today, there's roughly 50,000 graduates of the Marriott, Marriott School out in the workforce using the skills and values they developed here to improve individual businesses across a wide variety of our economy. And I know you'll be well prepared to take up your responsibilities when you leave here. The Marriott School is also well known for its global focus. Many of the students here have lived in other countries. The majority are bilingual. You have a great awareness and appreciation for the world beyond this campus, and that will be a tremendous advantage to you in the years to come. Those of you who grew up in another country or who have traveled abroad on missionary work have seen firsthand the rapid economic development taking place around the world and the dynamic populations that are growing in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. You also have a better perspective on how much still needs to be done to bring the technologies and advancements of a modern society to the developing part of the world. You understand the challenges that will come from meeting the needs and realizing the aspirations of billions of people on this planet. Here in the United States, the changes the changes taking place across the globe and in our own society have created a new set of anxieties for many Americans. Economic insecurity and concerns about the future due to rapid advances in technology and the global movements of jobs are very real for many Americans. We must acknowledge, however, that every nation has a right to aspire to a better quality of life and that free trade and economic growth are the means by which opportunity is created for all people. It's striking that even today, in the year 2013, more than one billion people, almost 1.3 billion people around the world, live in conditions where they have no access to electricity. That means they have no heat for their homes, they have nothing to cook their food on, they do not have the ability to clean their water nor refrigerate medicines, so they don't have hospitals, they don't have schools. For these men, women, and children, the innovation and technology that comes with economic growth means the difference between good health and safety, or sickness, and even possibly death. 
If you think about just this last year, in the year 2012, the world's population reached 7 billion people. Over the next 30 years, we will cross the 9 billion people mark. Much of the growth in population over these next three decades is expected to take place in those developing countries, which are still trying to lift much of their population out of poverty. These countries will lead the way, though, in the economic growth over the next three decades, averaging about 4.5% per year, compared to about 2% annual economic growth expected in the developed part of the world, including right here in the U.S. Now that may not seem like much, but compounded over time, the global economy will more than double its size between now and the year 2040, led by countries such as China, India, and other developing nations in, nations in Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Taken together, these three forces, the desire for a better quality of life for billions of people in developing countries, the rise in global population, and rising economic output will drive energy demand 30 percent higher between now and the year 2040. In fact, we'll need all forms of energy, everything we can develop, produce, bring about through new technology and renewables, step outs in solar, wind power, we're going to need it all. Meeting that challenge and doing so in a responsible and safe manner is the duty of companies like mine and others in the energy industry. And the good news is even as I speak to you this afternoon, as I mentioned, we have employees working the world over to ensure we can provide the energy the world's going to need in the years 2020, 2030, and beyond. Affordable, reliable energy supplies are a critical role to maintain our standard of living, the modern life we enjoy, but more importantly to lift all those other people in the world out of their conditions. But energy is not the only element. The world also will need sound public policies that allow for far-sighted investment, new technologies and services and innovation born of human ingenuity to bring prosperity to every corner of the globe. Just as important, the world will need leaders in every sector and every institution who are committed to integrity, which is the main focus of the talk this afternoon. Now, I think it's always useful to make sure we're working from the same definition of the words. So I went to Merriam-Webster, I actually went online, but I do have a dictionary and I check it from time to time. So I looked up the word integrity. It's a noun and the primary definition is the quality of being honest and fair. That's probably one most of us would have been able to identify. The secondary definition is the state of being complete and whole. Now as an engineer, I can relate to that because we talk about structural integrity. This building has structural integrity. It's going to remain standing while we sit beneath its, its roof. Bridges have structural integrity. So the state of being complete and whole. But I want you to keep that secondary definition in the back of your mind because we're going to come back and talk about a another application of the state of being complete and whole. So integrity is a critical building block of trust and cooperation. Integrity makes it possible for people of different backgrounds, different life experiences, different cultures, or different organizations to work together to solve the world's greatest challenges and most complex problems. When we combine our efforts with others of integrity, we bring unique skills and strengths to bear without fear of knowing that our counterparts are going to be both honest and forthright, and just importantly, that they can trust us as well. In other words, regardless of industry or project, integrity frees us to innovate, collaborate, and share over the long term. As the world becomes more interconnected, and global challenges require sophisticated, integrated solutions, the value of integrity only grows in its importance. In every sector, integrity will be key to unlocking high-impact technologies and new ways to conduct business that will make the world brighter for generations to come. We do not have to look far to find examples of the cost 
to individuals and to society as a whole when integrity is sacrificed for immediate or short-term gain or personal advancement. Ill-conceived financial schemes that destroy billions of shareholder value, much of which are held by people's pensions and other investments. Business, businesses that fail to perform the due diligence necessary to protect shareholders and the public from catastrophic losses. Leaders in government failing to stand up for standards and the open and honest discourse necessary to craft sound policy hold significant ramifications for markets globally. The damage resulting from this lack of integrity is not limited to the lives of citizens and tax taxpayers. Such damage strikes at the very heart of a free society and a free market. It undermines the public trust in the overwhelming number of businesses and entrepreneurs who do live and compete by the rules every day. And it creates a sense of cynicism that undercuts public dialogue and public policy. It is a fact of life that most citizens and individuals want to make a positive difference in the world in which we live and we work. Many of you, after all, are about to start that journey. You've worked hard. You sacrificed much to get where you are. Many of you have received support and encouragement from family and loved ones, along with your professors and faculty. You want your efforts to mean something beyond just a job. It is true that your education and the skills you have developed here will certainly play a part in your future success. But if you want to truly build a brighter future for the world, you must make the decision to live a life of integrity. Like seeds thrown on rocky soil, your knowledge and abilities will not flourish without ethical behavior and strong moral fiber. Contributing to society in a positive manner over the course of a lifelong career requires a strong foundation of personal and professional integrity. Choosing to live a life of integrity provides a wealth of blessings and benefits. Integrity makes us more competitive because it helps us embrace the truth, even when it is unpleasant, so we can improve in meaningful ways. Integrity makes us more responsible because it reminds us that our actions and decisions have broader implications and lasting consequences for our families, our communities, and even our nation. And integrity makes us more courageous because it allows us to stand firm with our principles, even if at times it means we must stand alone. Commit yourself to this standard of conduct, and I promise you, you will be the same person regardless of the situation or challenge you may find yourself confronted with. It'll make you a leader worth following, whether you're working with superiors in rank, leading your first team of colleagues, or mentoring the next generation. In a world that often seems to revel in moral ambiguity, where right and wrong are often shaded depending on the circumstances, integrity gives us a pathway to do the right things the right way, every time, whether anyone's looking or not. Such discipline is the true source of progress in a modern civilization because it, because it is a commitment to see our actions as part of a broader social fabric of cooperation, problem solving, and mutual advancement. Now I have no doubt that in your career you will have occasions where it may appear easier to take a shortcut or two. Perhaps time or budget pressures will tempt you to speed things up or understate a risk. Perhaps you'll face a situation in which it's easier to cover up a mistake than to own it and correct it properly. The pressure you feel may come from within, that you need to impress others or that you must have all the answers. Unfortunately, it may also come from your organization or directly from your supervisor or coworker. These pressures can be especially keen in the early stages of your career, pushing you toward decisions before the consequences are apparent. But a commitment to integrity is a commitment to stand firm before you face those pressures, challenges, and temptations. Committing yourself to a life of integrity and reminding yourself of that commitment often 
can give you the strength you need to resist the easy path that leads to poor, poor results or even ruin. Your integrity is the most valuable asset you will ever own. You lose it, it is extremely difficult to gain it back. Let me share with you some background on my company's approach to integrity. So I have to talk about what I know. At ExxonMobil, we believe that how we achieve results is just as important as the results themselves. That's why we take special care to ensure that we're walking the talk when it comes to ethical behavior. First, we recognize and promote ethical leaders in our corporation. And second, we establish a corporate citizenship model with specific metrics to hold the entire global organization accountable to the same standard no matter what their position, their location, their rank, or the culture they may be working in. We have a foundation of principles called our standards of business conduct that every employee around the world is expected to understand and follow. In fact, everyone is required to be trained in the standards of business conduct a minimum of every three years and sign an affidavit to the effect that you understand it and that to your knowledge you have complied. Our standard of business conduct makes clear that every employee is personally responsible for the safety of themselves, the public, and others at ExxonMobil. That every employee must comply with all the laws and regulations and that we are all expected to be honest and ethical at all times. In fact, our standards of business conduct states that employees will be held to a higher standard than simply abiding by the law. It reads, even where the law is permissive, the corporation chooses the course of highest integrity. Absent a rule, follow the highest rule you know. To help our people maintain ethical behavior in their day-to-day -day jobs, we've developed a series of processes and operating systems that ensure they have the guidance, tools, and support needed to make the right decision every time at every level of the organization. Through this focus on ethical behavior, over the years, we've identified four major types of integrity that govern our business activities, regardless of where we are or what we're doing. I believe they apply to anyone in business today, whether it's in our industry or another sector. First, there's operational integrity. Understanding what is expected and doing things the right way to protect lives, facilities, or assets. This is especially important in our business because of the specific nature of the risks that our people must manage around the clock. But it is valuable to any type of industry. Second is technical integrity. Technical integrity pr protects the research and development process. It drives accountability and makes it possible for us to develop solutions and innovations that are based on science rather than just wishful thinking. Third, there's personal integrity. Acting with personal integrity begins with holding ourselves accountable for our decisions and actions. Personal integrity pushes us to meet our commitments and achieve beyond what is expected of us while remaining loyal to the ethical boundaries of our profession. We're able to accept our setbacks gracefully without blaming others and learn more from our mistakes so that we continue to grow and excel. And fourth, there's managerial integrity which helps build trust as we lead others. It's important to remember that leadership is not a position or title. Becoming a leader is what happens naturally to those who embrace a life of integrity. As you grow in your career, your personal integrity will draw people to you. Your coworkers will come to rely on your humble, well-informed insights. Your supervisors will trust you because of your self-discipline. Everyone you come in contact, whether they're inside or outside of your organization, will see your excellent performance and recognize your trustworthiness. And as you take on more responsibility and gain experience, your personal integrity will naturally evolve into managerial integrity. You will exemplify what the best leaders demand from their people until you yourself become a leader. Put another, say, when, another way, when we do what we say we will do and exceed the expectations people have of us, we create a sense of trust. 
and satisfaction among our team members that enhances our working relationships. People come to know they can count on you, your work, and your work. Regardless of where you are in the world or what size the project before you, such integrity is invaluable and irreplaceable. So let me close by giving you three keys to living a life of integrity in your career. First, carefully consider the values and culture of the organizations where you seek to work. Look for employers who set high standards for personal conduct and who reward ethical leadership. Second, identify mentors who exemplify integrity and leadership excellence. Learn from their examples. See how they carry themselves and how they manage their responsibilities. Study how they communicate a vision and how they make decisions. Observe how they learn from mistakes or missteps, their own or those of others. And third, recognize that integrity is not unique to any one culture. No matter where you are in the world, integrity and character are prized by every great faith and tradition. It is in the book of Proverbs, he who walks with integrity walks securely. In summary, integrity means managing our lives in a way that focuses us on the ideals that unite us as people. It, is, it encourages us to be good citizens, to engage the community, and to work for the advancement of people. And now I return to Merriam-Webster's secondary definition of integrity, the state of being complete and whole. Absent a life of integrity, no human being can live a life that's complete and whole. With integrity, perhaps we have that chance. So I thank you for your attention. God bless all of you for what you're doing, and I look forward to your questions. Just a reminder, stand and uh, we'll have the stair steppers come up with a microphone um, and that'll signal Mr. Tillerson. Looks like we got one right over here. Yes, sir. What do you feel in your life has been the, the single decision, like your pivoting decision that has brought you and, and affected uh, most success for you? Well, uh, you know, your life, of course, is an accumulation of many, many decisions. Uh, some you made and you didn't even realize you made them. Uh, you realize it in your rearview mirror. But I, I guess I would have to say making the decision to go work for Exxon Company USA when I graduated. And, and the truth of the matter is I did not intend to go to work in the oil business. I knew nothing about it. Uh, I'm a civil engineer by training. I had co-opted and interned with Armco Steel the steel company. At that time, they had the largest mill west of the Mississippi on the Houston Ship Channel, and I had worked in that mill for a couple of summers. They had offered me a very good job, uh, more money than Exxon was offering me, uh, a promotion guaranteed in six months. But a couple of recruiters from Exxon were just very persistent. And I remember saying to them, I don't know what a civil engineer is going to do for an oil company. I don't know anything about the old business. And they just kept saying to me, don't worry about it. Come to workforce, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so I remember I told my wife, uh, I said, look, these guys at Exxon really want me to work for them. So I'm going to take a leap of faith, and I'm going to go to work. The job's down in Houston. If it doesn't work, up, work out, I'm going to do a checkpoint in one year. I'm going to see how it's going in one year. And if it's not working out, I'm pretty sure the guys at Armco will still hire me. Well, obviously, I did a one-year checkpoint. I fell in love with the business, and I fell in love with the company. And 38-plus years later, here I am. I would never in my wildest imagination have envisioned the journey I've taken to be standing before you today. But I promise you, every one of you have that same kind of journey ahead of you, but you don't know what it is. And my only advice to you is, when a door opens, walk through it. Whatever they want you to do, 
be willing to do it because you're going to learn something out of every experience. Whether you can relate as to why or not, there's a reason. There's a reason they're asking you to do that. Yes, sir, we got a microphone here. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot about mentors and learning from mentors. Can you tell us a little more about that mentor when you first hired into Exxon as a young engineer or another role model that you've had? Some of the attributes about them that you admired and uh, how emulating those has influenced your career? Well, and in, in 38 years, you do have a lot of mentors along the way. The, the one that I, I quoted about the pat on the back being only 18 inches was a field superintendent. Uh, he was a high school graduate military veteran, a field superintendent is a guy who supervises the wage earners that are out in the field, digging the ditches, the pumpers, pumping the wells, the maintenance people. And the engineers had to try to keep him pleased because they had problems we would have some. So that was, he was my first mentor that helped me understand, you know, don't take these words of, of attaboys that I'm giving you too seriously. And what I really learned working for him was not to take myself as a college graduate engineer too seriously either. Because what I learned out of those early experiences was the value of the entire organization and how important every single person out there is to our collective success. But along the way, I had some, some wonderful mentors who helped me with my communication skills. They helped me with my critical thinking processes. Uh, I had a mentor when I was about 15 years into my career, I became an, an assistant to him and I was his speech writer. And he was a meticulous with words, he was just meticulous with words. Uh, would labor over a word, I'd take the draft into him, we'd sit at his coffee table and he would take the pencil, number two pencil and roll it and twist it in his mouth. And this is eight or nine o'clock at night now, okay, so I've been working since seven that morning waiting on him and he'd scratch through the word and then he'd write a word in. He'd scratch through it again. But what I learned is when he got the right word, completely changed the message. So I learned the importance of communication and being very deliberate with what you say and very deliberate with the words you choose because it means a lot. That's what led to my fascination with Abraham Lincoln and why I'm a vice chairman of Ford's Theater Society. I've had a fascination with Lincoln's communication and writing skills. And as I read about Abraham Lincoln, what I found out, he was the same way. His uh, second inaugural address, one of his most famous, he changed the wording in that address multiple times, single words, kept changing them, kept changing them until the right word came out. Completely changed what the nation heard. So I really learned the power of communicating clearly and being careful with your communications. And so that was a very important lesson I learned from a, a mentor along the way. And then thirdly, when I got sent to Russia, uh, I'd been in Yemen for two, two and a half years. And <laughs> my wife used to say, well, the only reason they, they sent you to Russia is because they said, who can we get to go to Russia? Well, take Tillerson. He's in Yemen. He'll go anywhere. <laughs> and they were pretty right. I was ready to get out of Yemen. <laughs> but, <laughs> But I had, a, uh, I had a very dear mentor, a lady uh, who was a Russian Jew that had immigrated during the 1970-72 opening when Khrushchev opened the Soviet Union and allowed Russian Jews to leave. And she was very young and she and her husband immigrated to the United States. She was a tax accountant. She was teaching tax accounting at the University of Houston when we hired her and we needed a Russian speaker. And she was my translator and mentor when I went to Russia and lived in Russia for a while. And she really, helped, she really helped me appreciate how much upfront work you need to do to understand other cultures if you're going to do business there. So I did an enormous amount of reading. I did an enormous amount of research, talking with all kinds of people, just to understand the path that this society and this civilization has been walking. You really, when you move to cultures that are not yours, we assume so many things. We assume we know so much and we really don't know anything at all. And a lot of what we know has been shaded by the way it's been provided to us in our culture and society. 
And so as you move into other cultures around the world and deal with them, it's really important to get a historical perspective on where, where do the people that live in this country and treasure their country, and their, where have they been? Where are they coming from? And it is remarkable how much it improves your ability to understand and relate to them, even when you're adversaries. In fact, more importantly, when you're adversaries, to understand what's really important and what's not, and why do they, why do they act the way they do and think the things are important to them that don't seem important to me. So those were three critical mentorships along the way that each of them with my growing maturity and, and greater responsibility. And I guess the lesson out of all that, and I could give you a lot of other examples, is just always be listening and paying attention. And never be dismissive of anyone. You know, it'd be it'd been real easy to be dismissive of that high school graduate field superintendent who was never going to be anything more than a field superintendent. That's as far as he was ever going to get. He taught me a lot about the people down and near the bottom of the organization. Now, that person that taught me how important communications are, and that lady who taught me how important it is to gain a perspective of cultures you do not understand, a deep perspective, not something shallow. And it's a lifelong journey. You never finish. I'm still being mentored to this day. Oh, okay, got one up there. It's a microphone. Sorry. Um, so I'm interviewing actually with recruiters right now, and they say that they, in every recruit they look at, they're looking and they ask a question, they ask, could he be a future CEO or could she be a future CEO of the company? Um, and my, my question for you is, you, you mentioned that you never in your wildest dreams thought you'd be here today, that you'd be the CEO of ExxonMobil. Um, but you did mention that you would you encourage us to take all those open doors that are open to you. Are there certain things, certain key aspects of your personality, your diligence, your work ethic that, that maybe helped certain doors to open along that way to the path to where you are now today? Well, I think some of it was in some of the points I was making about integrity, honesty and integrity. Uh, I can tell you the things that we spot very early on are those individuals who have a very strong sense of honesty, loyalty, integrity. We can tell they they recognize it, and they value it, and they treasure it. And they're going to do everything they can to protect their personal integrity. And as they become more familiar with and aware of what our corporation is trying to do, they become very devoted to protecting the integrity of the corporation. So we're looking for those kinds of traits early on. Obviously, we're looking for people who, as they come to us, have, a, have some life experiences that indicate they have a, a, a certain self-assuredness. And for a lot of you who have worked in other countries or gone on internships or, as I said, have done mission work, you know, we know you have some life experiences that others don't have that, that you bring into the workplace and that's extremely valuable. But at the end of it all, it's not like we can identify, and I, I'm I promise you, they weren't looking at me that way when I walked through the door. Uh, so it's really going to be a function of the journey throughout your career. Uh, and I have, I have said this in interviews that I've given when I'm often asked, uh, and it is absolutely true. I never aspired to be the chairman and CEO. Now, my wife will tell you I achieved my objective about uh, 1992. I was 40 years old and I became a division manager and that was all I ever wanted to be. It was the best job I ever had. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, uh, you know, you do begin to recognize that you have a lot of capacity to do more and you begin to recognize you can contribute more, uh, not just for your own personal benefit but for your organization. And I think what the, where I see people in our senior management ranks flip over is when I realize they're not working any longer for themselves. They're working on behalf of their people. They care about their people, they care about their organization, and they care about their, their well-being and them doing well. And that's when people really begin to knock it out of the park. Look for a microphone here.
Mr. Tillerson, thank you very much again for being at our school today. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share with us an experience that you've had from your personal life where your integrity was challenged and how you overcame that challenge to your personal integrity. Well, uh, I've never, to be honest with you, I've never had mine questioned. Uh, and I don't, I don't say that lightly because uh, I'm sure some people probably have questioned it. They've never questioned it directly to me. I have been in situations where my commitment has been tested. And I'll give you a, a, the first, probably most significant, was when I was sent to Yemen. And it was the first time I had worked overseas. And I went into the country uh, right on the heels of the Civil War. Uh, and I went into a situation, uh, the reason I was sent there is the government was abrogating our contract. A French competitor had come in and bribed the president and were abrogating. And so I was sent in to either sort it out or turn it over to the lawyers to take it to the International Arbitration Court. And the very first meeting I had with the Yemeni oil minister, uh, late at night at his house, uh, we talked a little bit and then he said, well, Mr. Tillerson, uh, you know, this is, uh, I look forward to working with you, and the only thing I need you to do is to wire $20 million to this Swiss bank account, and he hands me an account number, and he said, I look forward to seeing you on your next visit. So I was uh, a bit stunned um, that, that it would come, you know, so direct like that. And I was relatively young. This was 1995, uh, so I was 40 three years old, and first time I'd been overseas kind of by myself to deal with this. And so I just, I, I paused him and I looked at him and I said, well, Excellency, you know, we just, we don't, I can't do that. We don't do that. And if that's the basis on which we, you want to do business, then I guess, you know, we, we can't do any business. And I appreciate you receiving me at your home. And, and I left. And I remember it was, uh, it's a long plane ride to Yemen. <laughs> fly Lufthansa to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Cairo, Cairo to Sanaa. And so then I had to fly home. And I remember flying all the way home, I'm thinking, golly, you know, I just walked away from a four and a half billion dollar deal. And I just kind of did it on my own. <coughs> <laughs> Didn't have cell phones back then. <laughs> Didn't even have good intercontinental phones from Yemen. The phones didn't work very well. And I'm all the way home, I'm thinking, okay, what else could I have done? What else could I have said? What else might I have, you know, was there, because I'm going to go back and tell my boss, boss, we're out. <laughs> and, so, and so I got back, and, I, and my boss was a guy in Dallas, uh, so he was kind of a big guy. And I flew to Dallas, and I said to him, uh, well, here's what happened. And without hesitation, he said, fine. He said, that's great. We're out of there. So about three weeks go by, and I get a letter from this oil minister wanting to know, Mr. Tillerson, when are you coming back to Sanaa? So I told my boss, I said, well, he's, he sent this letter. He said, well, go back and see what he wants. <laughs> so I took the long flight from <laughs> Dallas, got in, and I, I went to his house again about 8 o'clock at night. That seemed to be like when he liked to meet. And he said, okay, how are we going to sort this problem out? And, this, and the, the subject of a bribe never came up again, ever, in the two and a half years I lived there. So that was a, that was a very reinforcing experience to me. That it was as simple as that. All I had to do was say no in a respectful way. You know, it's his country. They have different standards. At this time, th in the 1990s, bribery for European countries was not only legal, it was tax deductible in two European countries. <laughs> so I, I don't say it to be critical, but I understood why the French went in there and bribed people. It was not illegal, and it was tax deductible. <laughs> so, but I couldn't. But, that, when I, and that, but that, that I have told that story many times in talking to my young managers, that oftentimes it's as simple as that. Respectful, don't blow the bridge up saying it, and just say, no, I'm sorry, we can't do, we don't do that, and I can't do that, and we'll never be able to do that. And I understand it's your country. You get to make the rules. But if those are the rules, then 
me and my company can't work here. And I thank you for giving me the time. Simple as that. I have had to do that a couple of other times. And both other, and the other two times, it worked out the same way. As soon as they figured out no meant no, they quit asking. Oh, okay, one more question up here. Hi, this might be on a little bit more of a personal note, but I was wondering um, what quality or role do you see in your wife that has most helped you to get where you are now? My wife? Yeah. Yeah, my wife. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife's a very strong person. Uh, she was raised evangelical and ran away from home when she was 17 because she'd had all that she could take. <laughs> She's a... Uh, She's a horse girl, professional rodeo, barrel racer for 40 years, and she runs our cutting farm now. Uh, she is the most spiritual, uh, deeply entrenched in the Bible person that I know. And uh, even though she ran away from it at 17, she never ran away from the Word. And she put me on my walk uh, when we met and got married and has kept me on my walk ever since. And that has been the strength she has given me. I was asked at a shareholders meeting one time, somebody said, I don't understand how you do what you do with you know all of the complexities and the demands and the travel schedule. And I tell them it's easy. I got people praying for me. <laughs> and it's as easy as that, and I know I do. I got a great uh, group of church friends and spiritual friends, and they all pray for me. And my wife is the chief, she's the chief leader of the prayer meetings. And that's the greatest uh, strength my wife has given me is a very strong foundation. Uh, and when you carry that with you, you're never afraid of anything. There's nothing or anybody that's going to make you afraid. Well, listen, I thank you for your questions. They're, they're great, good, important questions, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you. You're going to have a great life. You're going to have a great life out there. Some of it's, uh, there's going to be some good days, there's going to be some bad days. But you maintain and protect who you are, and you stick to the qualities that we've talked about today. And, and remember that that personal integrity is the most valuable asset you take away from this place with you. Don't ever let anyone take that from you. God bless you all.